peripheral nervous system video. Boop. So we have talked about the central nervous system ad nauseum. So we've talked about the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, well now we're going to get into the peripheral nervous system. It is divided into many other systems. So first it's divided into the somatic and the autonomic nervous system. And then the autonomic nervous system is further divided into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So starting with the somatic nervous system, this is the system that is involved in your voluntary movements. So it is mostly the contraction of your skeletal muscles, and those skeletal muscles are called your somatic effectors because they are the um, things carrying out the response to stimuli. All voluntary motor pathways are outside of the central nervous system, which makes sense because that's where the motor neurons are found. They are found in the peripheral nervous system. The main neurotransmitter involved in the somatic nervous system is acetylcholine. If you remember back to the muscular system, acetylcholine needed to be released from a presynaptic neuron to promote muscle movement. So it was released, it was received by a muscle, action potential was carried through, calcium was released, tropomyosin and myosin and all that fun stuff that you remember. So the somatic nervous system is all voluntary motor pathways outside of the central nervous system. This also includes your reflexes. So there can be autonomic reflexes, which are reflexes that you are not um, using voluntary muscle to conduct. And there's also somatic reflexes, which is contraction of your skeletal muscles. So an autonomic reflex includes your viscera. And I'm going to keep using the word viscera and visceral. And when I say that, it's meaning the heart, the stomach, the intestines, and the glands. So an autonomic reflex will contract smoother cardiac muscle. And this is great so that your heart can beat, um, so that you can move food throughout your stomach and intestines, so that you can breathe, and so that you can secrete hormones from glands when you need to without having to consciously think about it. There's also somatic reflexes, which are... Um, Includes swallowing, sneezing, coughing, vomiting. So sometimes coughing is induced by a person. It's voluntary. So that is not a somatic reflex. But if you are choking on something and you cough, that is a reflex. You don't need to integrate into your brain that you're choking for you to choke. Uh, also vomiting, if something's not agreeing with you, it will cause that gag reflex so that it doesn't go into your body. And remember, these reflexes do not integrate in the brain. It's very fast from sensory to interneuron to motor neuron. And sometimes an interneuron is not involved at all. So here's some examples of somatic reflexes. We tested these a while ago. Um, so remember, reflexes are used as a diagnostic tool so that a doctor can determine if you have something wrong <clears throat> with your nervous system. So the patella reflex is the knee-jerk reaction. Um, we have the Achilles reflex, which is if you tap the back of your Achilles, your foot should extend. I mean, I don't want you all to think you have something wrong with you if you're tapping your Achilles right now and it's not extending. Please see a doctor before you diagnose yourself. Don't WebMD, please. Um, the Babinski reflex is very interesting. So the Babinski reflex is present until you're about one and a half or two. And the doctor will run their finger or a pen from the bottom of the heel of your foot up to your toe. If your big toe extends and your little toes flare out or spread apart, that is a positive Babinski reflex. And this occurs because um, the, ner the nervous systems of infants are not fully mature yet, so they do have that reaction to that stimuli. As you grow up, though, and you mature and your nervous system matures, that reflex should go away. If that reflex is still occurring into your older years, that can be an indicator of ALS, tumors, multiple sclerosis, meningitis, and other symptoms or syndromes of the nervous system. Uh, we also have the corneal reflex, which is when you wink when someone touches your cornea, including yourself, which is why putting on contacts is pretty difficult. And there's also the abdominal reflex which is if someone tickles you or strokes the side of your abdomen, causes you to draw in your abdominal wall. And it sucks. So this is a diagram showing the knee-jerk reaction. Um, if you remember, this is called a monosynaptic reflex because only one synapse is involved. So we have our sensory neuron relaying the impulse into our spinal cord. 
directly to a motor neuron, which is attached to our effector, causing our knee jerk to our knee to jerk up. Um, there is an interneuron displayed here, but that interneuron is not used in the knee jerk reaction. It is just a monosynaptic from the sensory directly to the motor neuron. So the autonomic nervous system is the second division of the peripheral nervous system, and it's your involuntary body functions, your visceral body functions. So your heart rate, your respiratory rate, maintaining digestion and urogen, which is excreting your urine. This is the system that's most involved with maintaining homeostasis. Um, so it's regulating your heartbeat, contracting smooth muscles and glandular secretions. And if you remember, smooth muscles are also found in your blood vessels. So if there's something wrong with your autonomic nervous system, it could cause your body to stop pumping blood throughout and constricting and dilating blood vessels. Um, so the autonomic nervous system conducts impulses from the central nervous system to the autonomic effectors. And those autonomic effectors are those visceral effectors, so your glands, your heart, stomach, intestines. The autonomic nervous system is broken down further into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. For the autonomic nervous system could, to conduct impulses from the central nervous system to those visceral effectors, it actually goes through these ganglia. And if you remember ganglia as a congregation of cell bodies, and those cell bodies and their axons all have similar functions. That's why they're all grouped in the same area. So lateral to the spinal cord are two chains of ganglia. There's one over here on the right and one on the left. So the impulse will <clears throat> be carried from the spinal cord and then out to these chains of ganglia. And what these chains can do is they can choose to all communicate with each other and cause a mass response, or they can choose to have a more targeted response. Um, and that's shown here. So here we have our central nervous system, so our brain and our spinal cord. Lateral to the spinal cord, we have one of the chains of ganglia. And there's another chain over here for the parasympathetic system. So you can see that impulses from different areas of the spinal cord will go through many ganglia, and they can congregate, like down here, into one effector. So in this example, it's the bladder. They can also have many ganglia also congregate, but then affect multiple organs. So multiple areas of the liver, multiple areas of the stomach and digestive system. Going back up. So the parasympathetic nervous system, sorry, the autonomic nervous system is divided into the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous systems. The parasympathetic is responsible for your feeder breed rest and repose responses. This system is most active when you're resting and during very ordinary activities and conditions. No stress, no excitement. You're pretty much like sitting in class, bored out of your mind. That is your parasympathetic nervous system. And it counteracts your sympathetic nervous system. They work together. They activate and inhibit the exact same organs, but it's to maintain homeostasis and so that you can relax after high stress situations. So the sympathetic nervous system is more in tune with your fight or flight responses. So it's preparing your body for energy expending activities, activities in uh, very high stress environments or maybe an emergency. So the sympathetic nervous system might increase your heart rate and then the parasympathetic nervous system will decrease your heart rate and bring you back to rest. They're not working at the same time. It's typically the sympathetic nervous system will um, act on your body first and then the parasympathetic. So back to this picture, you can see some effectors and uh, responses that they have in high stress situations for the sympathetic nervous system and in resting situations of the parasympathetic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system has two main neurotransmitters that it uses to conduct the resting responses and then the fight or flight responses. If norepinephrine is released or adrenaline, that is um, more in tangent with the fight or flight response. And it will excite all of these different effectors. 
um, acetylcholine is also released and that is more with the digest and rest system and that excites like your gastrointestinal tract to continue pushing your food out of your body because you're not in that high stretch situation. So norepinephrine is, when it's released, it's released from what's called an adrenergic fiber. Um, the word fiber is referring to just the axon of a neuron. Um, and this is typically in the postganglionic sympathetic neurons. And I'll show you what postganglionic means on the next slide. Uh, when acetylcholine is released, that's a cholinergic fiber from a cholinergic fiber. And that is, um, remember, just the axon of a, of a neuron. So this occurs in both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic neurons. And in this diagram, you can see, so we have the sympathetic nervous system in yellow, the parasympathetic in green and a chain of neurons leading to effector cells. So the areas that are white, this kind of egg-like white area, that is the ganglia. Um, for our purposes, we just have one cell body there, but this is where a large group of cell bodies will be. So in the sympathetic nervous system, anything before that ganglia is called a pre-ganglionic neuron, and anything after is the post-ganglionic neuron, and the same thing for the parasympathetic nervous system. So here we have acetylcholine released in both examples. So this will be a cholinergic receptor. Um, a nicotinic receptor means that it's, um, it's an excitatory neurotransmitter and it has a really fast response. So it sends the impulse really quickly. Down here at the postganglionic neuron, we have norepinephrine released. So this is more of a fight or flight response for this effector cell. Over here we have acetylcholine released, so this will be more of a digest and rest response for this effector cell. And the same thing down here, so we have acetylcholine released, it will have a very, um, like I said, digest and rest effect on these effector cells. So norepinephrine is released um, and it binds to those adrenergic receptors. There's two types of receptors, there's the alpha and the beta. And they work in tangent. So both receptors are found on those um, cell bodies. So it can either constrict blood vessels or dilate blood vessels. And it really depends on which one you need. Um, to inhibit norepinephrine, monoamine mono oxidase um, is an enzyme that will break down the norepinephrine if it's taken back up into the synapse of the presynaptic neuron. So it needs to be actively transported, transported back. It can diffuse just simply into the tissue surrounding it, and that's why some um, norepinephrine won't be degraded, which means it will remain active longer than acetylcholine, causing that fight or flight response to have a stronger and longer lasting impact than the digest and rest. These diagrams are too confusing, so please don't stress on those. Um, so acetylcholine, uh, binds to the cholinergic receptors. Um, and there's two types. There's nicotinic, and it is related to nicotine, and there's muscarinic. So nicotinic receptors are receptors that will cause an excitatory response, but it's very rapid. So it's a very, very, very fast response. Whereas a muscarinic receptor, it is excitatory, but it's a much slower response. And if you remember from probably last week, um, to inhibit the action of acetylcholine, the enzyme acetylcholine esterase will come in and break down that acetylcholine. Acetylcholine will not diffuse into the tissue surrounding it. So once acetylcholine esterase comes in to degrade it, all of the acetylcholine will be degraded. And then the rest and repose um, situation will be eliminated.